Mr. Prime Minister, thank you very much for coming to speak with us tonight. I know that this is a time of many challenges, both internationally and domestically, and we very much appreciate that you took the time and the opportunity to join the opening dinner of the 47th Annual Mission to Israel. Before we begin the program, I'd like to acknowledge the presence and the friendship of Shimrit Meyer, Senior Advisor, Elad Tenet, Head of the Public Diplomacy Directorate, Avivit Barilan, Deputy National Security Advisor for Foreign Policy, Matan Sidi, Media Advisor, Karen Hajioff, Foreign Media Advisor, Yisrael Klitzner, Diaspora Affairs Advisor, Gadi Ezra, Director of the National Public Diplomacy Unit, Major General Avi Gil, Military Secretary to the PM. So now I'd like to hand the floor over to William Daroff, of the CEO of the Conference of Presidents, for a formal greeting and introduction. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Diane. Mr. Prime Minister, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Every Prime Minister of Israel since Levi Eshkol has joined us and addressed this gathering, and we greatly appreciate that you have continued this hallowed tradition. We do appreciate you joining us, even with your hectic travel schedule. This past week, with your historic visit to Bahrain, representing yet another step towards Israel's normalization with the nations of the Gulf and greater peace and stability to the region to which you, the American government, and the Conference of Presidents are dedicated. Sustaining and maintaining the strong relationship between America's diaspora community and the Prime Minister of Israel has always been of utmost importance to the Conference of Presidents. You demonstrated your sensitivity and concern towards the rela this relationship when, in 2018, you immediately traveled to Pittsburgh and joined our community, including me, Malcolm Holmline, and our then chair, Arthur Stark, in mourning the devastating loss of life at the Tree of Life Synagogue. We were privileged to meet with you in the days immediately before you became Prime Minister and a few weeks after as you helped to end Israel's seemingly endless cycle of elections and stagnation to form Israel's 36th government. We discussed your vision for Israel, your special understanding of diaspora issues, which are based on your years as diaspora minister, as well as your unique connection to the United States and the ways in which Israel and American Jewry must work together to ensure a safer Israel and a secure Jewish communities. Mr. Prime Minister, the Conference of Presidents stands ready to continue the partnership that has existed between us and Israel's Prime Minister since our founding over 60 years ago. And we look forward to working together to combat anti-Semitism, to strengthen the United States-Israel relationship, and to stop Iran from developing a nuclear capacity. Pundits often point to the crisis between Israel and the diaspora, but I am confident that working together, by meeting and engaging together, you have the vision and the know-how to ensure that the bonds between our two communities continue to be strong, unbreakable, and vibrant. Thank you again for joining us. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to welcome the Prime Minister of Israel, Naftali Bennett. How pleasant and uh, good it is for brothers and sisters to be together. Uh, Dayan Lab, uh, Chair of the Conference of uh, Presidents, uh, Malcolm Hanlein, Vice Chair, my friend, William Deroff, CEO, and my friends, that uh, you all came from far away. While the world has its eyes glued uh, to the Ukrainian-Russian border, trying to imagine what turn history will take, we in Israel and the stable uh, states in the region, we're keeping one eye on the Ukrainian-Russian border um, and another on Vienna, where the talks between the world powers and Iran are taking place. So we look to Vienna and we're deeply troubled by what we see. For Israel and all the stability-seeking forces in the Middle East, the emerging deal, as it seems, is highly likely to create 
more violent, more volatile Middle East. Now, there's no doubt that America is and will remain our biggest and strongest friend. But ultimately, it's us. It's us who live in the region, and it's us here in Israel who will bear the consequences of this agreement. To be sure, our position is not automatic. We're not against any deal per se. But many people who supported the original JCPOA deal back then are very worried about the agreement right now. Now, when we discuss this matter with our friends in the United States, we all agree on the diagnosis. Yeah, Iran is at a very advanced phase of its uranium enrichment project. That's a fact. They've crossed one threshold after another, one red line after another, including enriching at 60% enrichment grade as of last April. So this is the situation that we on both sides of the ocean, we inherited. This is the hand we were dealt. It is what it is. And there's no point in playing the blame game right now. We need to address the challenges at stake. The single biggest problem with this current agreement is that the freeze sunsets in two and a half years. Two and a half years, which is right around the corner. In two and a half years, Iran, by this agreement, will be able to freely develop, install, and operate advanced centrifuges. According to the agreement as it stands right now, in just two and a half years, they'll be able to set fields the size of a football field full of centrifuges spinning, and it'll be legal. In the meantime, as an advanced payment, Iran gets now tens of billions of dollars in frozen assets and access to new markets. And a lot of this money is going to be directly funneled right away towards attacking Israel, towards attacking our allies, and even attacking American soldiers in the Middle East. That's what they're doing now. That's what they do every week. But right now, they're very weak. The real has depreciated. They're at one of their weakest spots in history, and now we're going to pour tens of billions of dollars back into this apparatus of terror. I want to highlight three points that we'll all need to address vis-a-vis -vis this agreement. As I said, the sunset clause, the clause that says that in two and a half years, they no longer have to freeze the development of uranium enrichment centrifuges, leaves Iran with a fast track to military grade enrichment. And even in the time until it sunset, even these two and a half years, they don't even have to destroy the centrifuges they developed recently. Secondly, the next point is a point that America has not yet agreed upon. The Iranian regime is insisting, listen to this, on closing the open files of the IAEA. These are essentially hot investigations pertaining to possible military dimensions. Let me turn that into simple English. So Iran has been hiding and is still hiding nuclear weapon related materials as we speak. The, these inspectors that work very hard, they caught Iran. Iran's been caught red-handed and now Iran is demanding that these very inspectors will pretend to forget what they saw. Erase the memory like men in black, men in black, you remember? Now, this is the equivalent, I want to explain. Imagine some town and there's, there's some murderer on, on the large and there's a detective who's been working really hard for months and he's now finally found that this, this person has a pistol. 
illegally. So now the sheriff comes and tells him, forget it. He doesn't have a pistol. Close the file. Pretend that nothing happened. Not only is it a problem because the pistol is still there even if we ignore it, think what it does to the inspectors. What does it mean to the IAEA if Iran gets its way? Is the IAEA a political organization? No. It's a professional organization whose goal is to shed light on the truth, on reality, be it what it may. And if they allow political considerations to tell the inspectors, forget everything you've done, that would be a profound blow to the IAEA. Our friends in America are telling us that they are standing strong on this, and I hope to see that through. The third point, the agreement is going to pour, as I said, tens of billions of dollars into the Iranian terror apparatus. Iran works through proxies in Yemen, in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Gaza. Now imagine you're going to get more UAVs, more attacks on merchant ships, more attacks and more rockets on Israel, on our allies through its proxies. And now to cap the chutzpah, Iran has a new demand on top of everything, right? They are demanding now to delist the IRGC. Let me explain. I want you to understand what this means. Iran's asking to let the biggest terror organization on earth off the hook. To look at this terror organization terror organization and say, it's not a terror organization, to pretend. This is the new demand. So my friends, this agreement indeed creates a set of new challenges for Israel's security. I'm being very clear about the holes and the challenges it's going to create, but let me be clear. One way or another, I've got no doubt that Israel will prevail with whatever circumstances we're faced. Yes. <laughs> We've developed a strategy around the deal. We think the deal is going to make it much, much harder, but we're here. Yes, this agreement will enrich this brutal and incredibly corrupt regime. But this is only temporary. See, if I was an investor, and I'm not allowed to invest as prime minister, <laughs> Iran would be the last place on earth I would invest in. What a bad investment. Unstable. The real has been devaluated more than ever. Rotten, corrupt regime. Nobody in his right mind should invest in a country whose biggest export is terrorism. That's their single biggest service and product. That's what they export. And look on the other hand at Israel. Israel is stronger than ever. Israel is currently growing at an 8% growth rate in 2020 through the latest rounds of COVID. Our economy is booming and will continue to grow, becoming more competitive and less regulated. We passed a budget after many years without one. Our high tech is breaking all its previous records. That's where I spent my previous life before making the huge mistake of entering politics. <laughs> We're adding now more Jewish men and Arab women to the workforce. We had these two groups that were not integrated. Now we're bringing them in. We ensured political stability after four rounds of of elections, I stopped, took the decision that we're going to pull Israel out of this hole. And our path is as good as ever. I want to tell you, we're also building unprecedented military capabilities. We have to be by far the strongest nation in the region, much ahead of everyone else. It's our duty to provide security to our people 
while being a reliable ally to our friends. So yes, there are challenges, but we're up to them. Let me be clear. Iran will not accept Iran. I'll be clear again. <laughs> Israel will not accept Iran as a nuclear threshold state. And we have a clear and unnegotiable red line. Israel will always maintain its freedom of action to defend itself. This government, from day one, made it a priority to reach out to the world, to restore and nurture the relations with our neighbors, my very first weeks, I flew out to meet King Abdullah, President Sisi, MBZ, and now the King of Bahrain. We're strengthening our friendship with our neighbors. We're also committed to working with both sides of the aisle in the United States, as we did in the past. Just this week, I'm going to be meeting dozens of elected officials from the United States, Democrats and Republicans alike. Israel is becoming bipartisan yet again. Now, despite the differences we have on this agreement, and we do, and we're very candid about it, our relations with my good friend, President Biden, and his administration will remain close and robust. We're going to continue to focus on Israel's security. We will say, and more importantly, we will do everything necessary to ensure it. Thank you. I'm going to take some questions. Okay. So I'm here. So I, uh, uh, due to time constraints, Mr. Prime Minister, I have uh, three questions here that represent uh, the focus of the Conference of Presidents and represent what many of us in this room have been speaking about. Uh, the first question is, Israel recently refused to cooperate with the Human Rights Council's Commission on Inquiries investigation into the May conflict with Gaza. This commission, as you know, is unlimited, well-funded, and also deals with matters occurring within Israel's borders. This comes on the heels of numerous NGO reports over the last few years that represent new efforts to delegitimize Israel with the spurless and ahistoric charge of apartheid. How is the Israeli government pushing back against these accusations, and what messages can we take back home to America? Thank you. I'd invite uh, these NGOs and these organizations uh, to see a cabinet meeting in Israel, to see a government, the most diverse government in Israel's history, with Jews and Arabs, with religious and secular, with right and left. I'd invite them to the Supreme Court of Israel to see Arab Supreme Court judges. I'd invite them to the streets of Israel to see an Israel that works so hard to give a bigger and better opportunity to every boy and girl in Israel. I am responsible for all children in Israel alike, Jews and Arabs. And it's tough. It's not easy. But I think Israel, not being located on the borders of Switzerland or Belgium, but rather having neighbors such as uh, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, Hamas, ISIS, for heaven's sake. We still have ISIS on our southern border. And at the same time, we're building this beautiful tower of democracy, of openness, of a beautiful Jewish state which provides full equal rights to all its citizens. So now they open up new organizations and fund them because there's not been enough slander of Israel or Jews lately. Here's what we do. We stand up. We speak up, every one of you. 
That's my ask, one ask from every friend we have. Speak up. Don't portrait a more beautiful place than it is. Just give the real truth about Israel. And the truth about Israel is it's a remarkable miracle of democracy in the toughest place on earth. And we ought to be proud of it and fight for it and never give up. But we also have to do better asbara. Um, I, I think uh, Israelis have always been uh, uh, not good enough at uh, explaining. You know, we have, we have uh, I, I studied in, in America a couple of we, uh, years, so there was show and tell. You know that they don't have show and tell in Israel? And, and that's one of our problems. Avi, my military, the, the, let's talk to the education minister and, and put show and tell in Israel. Um, it's something we have to work on, but uh, make no mistake, those who are out there to tarnish Israel, it's not from uh, uh, real motives. It's uh, because they don't like who we are and what our heritage is. So we'll fight back everywhere. Toda. Thank you, sir. Secondly, and related, the U.S. Jewish community is facing a wave of anti-Semitism, including physical attacks on synagogues and the Jewish people, unlike anything we've experienced in recent memory. We are simultaneously seeing an increase in anti-Semitism across the world. We have been engaged in efforts to normalize the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism as a crucial tool to understanding and fighting modern anti-Semitism. One of the main tenets of modern anti-Semitism is anti-Zionism. As you know, while it's impolitic to call somebody a dirty Jew, it is not, unfortunately, in many circles, impolitic to call them a dirty Zionist. How can we fight this scourge of anti-Semitism together? And what do you see Israel's role as being? Yeah, we, I'd say a few decades ago, there was a feeling that anti-Semitism was some uh, relic uh, that's going to fade away. But it has this ability to, to return, to rebound again and again. Um, I think the most important thing is to be together. To be together. Before we fight anti-Semitism, we, uh, Jews in Israel and Jews in the diaspora, have to stand together, notwithstanding differences, and there are differences. Israel has a different composition of its society than the United States. That's, that's a fact. And we don't need to ignore it. What we need is to to talk, and what we need is to respect each other. And what we need is for each other to always be there one for another. And it requires that, you know, I'd say on our side, that we have to be more embracing, more open, uh, more secure in our identity. Israel now, uh, if in the past America was viewed in Israel sort of as two things, a, a source for Aliyah and a wallet. Well, Israel's strong. And make no mistake, I'd love every Jew to live in Israel, but I also recognize and respect the fact that many Jews uh, are going to lead their lives in many places in the world. So we have to strengthen the, the, that feeling that, that's embedded in every Jew, but sometimes have to, has to be sort of peeled and exposed that we care about each other. When a Jew in France is hurt, I hurt. When a Jew in Israel is hurt, then Jews in New York hurt. We're one, we're one. And we have to strengthen this. We have to keep this relationship going. This is the first time in Jewish history since the first temple that the biggest Concentration of Jews is in the state of Israel, which is good. But it, it provides or sets a new responsibility on Israel, on me as Prime Minister. I hold two caps, or kippot, if you will, 
and as a bald person, I need to. Um, one is Prime Minister of the State of Israel, responsible for every citizen, Jew and non-Jew alike, but also the leader of the Jewish people everywhere. And we, we have to look at the next 50 years and, and restore and, and, and identify what our mission is. Jews were always about building something better, making something better together. So it's tough. Uh, but first and foremost, talk, meet, come. Got some good news earlier today. I decided to op open up with zero restrictions. Israel was going to be open on March 1st. You don't need to, you're not going to need to bring any proof of anything. Just do a test before and a test after. But no uh, vaccination stuff. And hopefully, I hope we don't see another variant. So we're going to work very hard on this. Uh, we need you, you need us, and we're one. Let me just thank you on that, uh, Mr. Prime Minister. The divide that has developed over the last two years from our inability to come here has been troubling, and we appreciate your efforts to open those doors. The last question is, unlike Israel's tact during the 2015 JCPOA, your approach to a potential deal with Iran in Vienna has been far less confrontational, particularly as it relates to our American government. I wonder if you can discuss how this has benefited Israel's strategic position and how you see it playing out. Sure. Just on the previous piece, in order for us to stay together, uh, we need Judaism to, to stay and, and exist in, in, uh, in America. Uh, my dad, may rest in peace, he uh, told me a story. He, he grew up with my mom in uh, San Francisco, as far remote from uh, practicing Judaism as anyone. Uh, when they made Aliyah to Israel, they didn't know a word in Hebrew or almost anything about, about davening or tefillot or First time he made an aliyah to the Torah in Israel, he already had some Hebrew. So they asked him, Ech korim lecha? What's your name? And he said, uh, James. And then they said, Lo, 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 lo. Ma Hashem Ivri? What's your Hebrew name? And he said, Oh, oh, Yaakov. Ben? Shloshim. <laughs> ben is a son of, but it's also your age. And he said he's 30 years old. And uh, <laughs> So we, we have to close that gap. We need... Um, also in Israel, we, we need to be less uh, tense one with another. Th this government uh, is, is evolving and it's a, a very efficient and, and uh, successful government, but I'm learning a lot. I'm, I'm not coming only uh, you know, to, to preach the other side. Uh, the, the fundamental uh, work of this government or basis of this government, we call it the 70-70 rule, where 70% 70 of the folks in Israel agree on 70% of the issues, so let's shelf the other 30% that we disagree upon. But, alas, there's reality, and reality brings those 30% uh, on our plate. So we actually have to work out complicated stuff, and what I've learned and I've, I've grown, uh, grown a new part, it's called ears. Very rare in Israelis. We don't have them much. Uh, Israelis tend to um, not have dialogues, but two monologues. And, uh, and, and we're learning to listen. I've not changed my, my values, uh, but I think we are changing the way we go about things our demeanor, our respect one for another, our ability to, uh, to accept tough decisions that aren't always perfect according to my precise values for the bigger, the bigger need. And the bigger need is to move Israel forward. Regarding uh, your question, William, the, just to recap the question, uh, we, we've taken a different approach, uh, not the the uh, confrontational approach um, simply because we saw the results and uh, I'm not looking to fight, I'm looking to bring the best results for Israel. We are cognizant of what the United States administration is willing to do, what it's not willing to do. So when I came in into uh, my, my job, 
I said, we're going to build a strategy around the deal, and w there's lots of things we need to do. We need to ensure that the enrichment program doesn't make progress. We need to ensure that the weaponization program doesn't make progress, which is not included in the deal. We need to make sure that the uh, missile project is stopped. We need to make sure that the regional terror is stemmed. And the, the deal only encompasses one small part, the enrichment. Just to clarify this, imagine the enrichment being a, a sort of um, gunpowder, okay? You, you create a lot of gunpowder, but still you need the pistol and the bullets, right? You need, and they don't have that yet. They have now a machine that's gonna grow very big that can create a lot of gunpowder, but still you need to build the pistol. And so we have a comprehensive strategy. We're not gonna make the same mistake that was made previously where when the deal was signed, sort of uh, folks uh, let go of the ball. We're on it. I've invested, I, the, the government has invested billions of shekels in rapid uh, uh, buildup in cyber missiles, other areas, in order for us to be able to address this. So one way or another, we're, uh, we're gonna also ask uh, for American help in this, uh, and we are working together with America on this strategy day in, day out. But I have to be honest, th this agreement is gonna make it much, much harder for us. You see, Iran's enveloped Israel over the past 30 years with these proxy armies around us. What a smart strategy. They placed Hezbollah in the north, Islamic Jihad in the south, both of them 100% funded by Iran. And how pleasant is it for Iran to sit back, supine, and have their proxies fight us? I fought them personally in Lebanon. I lost my best friend fighting an Iranian proxy. Our strategy is changing. We're shifting the focus so Iran will also pay a price for its uh, misdemeanor in, in, in the region, for its actions. No longer will they be able to get away with spreading terror and think that everything's okay. So we're working with friends, not only the United States, we're gonna work with others. Um, and we'll, you know, we're gonna deal with the, the, the cards that we got, and uh, as I said, we'll prevail. One last question from the audience, if anyone has. This is a very un-Israeli audience. Yeah, go ahead. I'm also. Uh, no, so, so look, we're working through all of it. Um, I, I don't have uh, huge news yet. We've got the, the, the upcoming budget. We're working on it. One thing we're not waiting for is physical upgrade of the... Uh, uh, it's called the Israel Plaza. It's the one I built back in 2014. Uh, there's uh, the, the uh, place that you can pray, uh, so we're gonna upgrade uh, the, the quality. Uh, but on, on the other facets, we're gonna continue the dialogue. And one very last question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, we're, we're, we've added that into our national security threats. The question was regarding uh, upgrading old buildings, especially vis-a-vis -vis earthquakes or missiles. So we've got some incentives that uh, basically tell someone who's got a, a house, you can build a whole new room uh, and, and uh, extend your building rights without paying any taxes on it, and, and if you're gonna upgrade the building. So lots of folks in the center of Israel did it because it, there's a, an economic uh, deal there. It, it makes sense. In the periphery where uh, it's less so, we're working on ways to, to do it. We, we understand that that's a, a threat and that we have to uh, take care of it. I want to thank all of you. Um, you know, it, it means a lot. Uh, some people say I've got the toughest job on earth. 
um, and uh, which is keeping Israel secure, thriving, growing, and, and we need you. We need you. All we need is one thing, to speak up and fight for Israel. That's what we want. Always speak up. Never be silent when someone slanders Israel. And be proud of Israel. Be proud of this amazing miracle at 8% growth, fastest growth in the modern open world. We're number one growth of OECD. While we've got all these bad guys around us, and it depends on us being beyachad together. So thank you very much. Toda raba. I'm going to ask you all to be seated for half an hour. Um, this week, we read in the parsha about the machzis hashekel, the giving of a half shekel. And the question was, why couldn't they give a whole shekel? Because we always have to be reminded that each individual is dependent on the other. That to make the whole, you need two, you need a community, you have to come together. That giving, if everybody would have just given the shekel, each one would be independent, not dependent on the others. So we're reminded constantly of the interdependence of the Jews, one with another. We see it this month, the month of Adar, Mishanichnas Adar, Marim Simcha, we're supposed to be joyous. This year we knew two Adars because we missed one last year, but also because I think of all the tsaras that you face and that you enumerated, we need to be reminded of the joy and the celebration, not just of the challenges, of the opportunities, of the wonderful achievements that you enumerated, only a few of. You could have spent here all night telling just the inventions and the high-tech discoveries and all the things that have taken place just in this year. We also derive inspiration from the month of Adar with the holiday of Purim because it's, it reminds us, we overcame the Iranians once, we're gonna overcome them again. And, and the modern day Hamans should read a certain book about Esther to remind them about what their faith will likely be. So we stand together with you in every respect. We come together to make the whole shekel. We read Vayakel now, this week, and the mitzvah of Hakel teaches us that the greatest dangers to the Jewish people are not the external enemies or natural disasters. It's apathy, indifference, and ignorance. Those are the things we could not overcome. And your challenge to us to speak up means that we have to educate ourselves, we have to educate our communities to be able to stand up and tell the truth. That's Israel's strongest weapon. It always has been and it will be. We also read about Ola Rego. So when you talk about tourism, we're reminded of the ancient tourists who came and came up to the temple, but to be reminded also of the responsibilities we have. Many of us were pained by the separation from Israel and maybe it taught us not to take Israel for granted, which has happened too often that we could just get on a plane and come and being denied that for a while reminds us of how central Israel is in all our lives. When they built the Mishkan, they couldn't move until the Mishkan actually was in place because all of the tribes would have been dispirited, everyone chasing to get in first place. I know that wouldn't happen in Israel, but everybody trying to get in first place. And once they put the Mishkan, everybody organized around it. We organize around Yerushalayim and around Israel. It is the unifying force. You have a diverse group of the American Jewish community, but we come together to stand with Israel, to stand for United Yerushalayim, to stand with you against Iran and any of the other enemies. We are one shekel together, and that will give us the strength to stand against all of the enemies that arise against us. And I want to present you. Can. We want to present you with this, for the sake of Zion, I will not be silent. For the sake of Jerusalem, I will not rest. This is done by a famous artist here, Sharon Binder in Jerusalem. And we uh, actually get to keep it. And, uh, this one's going into my office. This one. Oh, you'll check.